My name is Gabor Mate. I work in the downtown east side of Vancouver as a doctor. I've been in family practice before then for 20 years. I've knocked around the medical world doing various um, duties and engagements as, I, as my interest takes me. And for the last 10 years, I've worked at a place called the Portland Hotel, which is a domicile. It's a place where a lot of people live who otherwise would be living in the street. For the last several months, I've worked at OnSite, which is the detox facility associated with InSight, the supervised injection site. So thank you all for honoring me by coming out to hear me. And I just offer up the prayer that the speaking that we do with one another this afternoon may benefit all of humanity and uh, help ease the pain and suffering in this world, of which there is a lot. And um, it and and a disproportionate, largely large share of that pain and suffering falls upon Aboriginal peoples around the world, whether in Latin America, whether in Australia, whether in uh, the Middle East, Africa, or whether in North America. Much of that suffering is rooted in addiction which is my subject this afternoon. Now, there's nothing about Aboriginal peoples that make them more, makes them more prone to addiction. There's nothing intrinsic, there's nothing innate, there's nothing in their nature or their character that drives them to addiction. So it's got nothing to do with um, any weakness or flaw or predisposition from the inside. It really has to do with what are the conditions in the world that feed and drive and promote addiction. And these patients of mine die young. They get diseases from their HIV. They get infections of their brains, of their heart valves, of their spines. They get crippled. They commit suicide. They're killed by violently. They overdose. They get cancer. They die of liver disease. And few of them live into their 50s. And the question is why? Why do keep why do people keep doing these um, terribly damaging things to themselves, which has such negative consequences in our lives, where they lose their health, they lose their lives, they lose their families, their children, their dignity, their bodies, their teeth, their, 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 their earthly possessions, and still they persist. And it's not possible to answer that question it's not possible to answer that question if we see it as weakness of will, if we see it as moral failure, if we see it as some kind of a, a bad decision that people make. It's much deeper than that. In fact, the question we really have to ask is, if people are using drugs, despite the negative consequences, what does the drug do for them? What makes the drug so important in their lives? It must do something. It must do something very essential, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So if we're going to understand addiction, we first have to understand what is it that the person gets out of it. It's clear for all of us to see what the damage is, but what is the good? What is the short-term benefit that the addict is looking for? Well, to answer that question, just look at the drugs, okay? So there's one major class of drugs that you all know. It's called, they're called the opiates. The opiates are drugs like heroin and morphine, or which come from a poppy plant, an Asian poppy, or their man-made uh, analogs like uh, Percocet and Oxycontin and so on. These are all opiates. Well, what are opiates? Why do we use them in medicine? What are they? Okay, painkillers is the main thing. We use them as painkillers. Okay, now, but they're donors in the sense that they also, they not only kill physical pain, they also kill emotional pain. They also kill emotional pain. It turns out that if you look at the, at the brain scan of human beings, when they're feeling emotional pain, the same part of the brain lights up as when they're feeling physical pain. So whether I call you a terrible name that really hurts you and insults you, or whether I cut you with a knife, the same part of the brain registers it on the emotional level. So the emotional suffering associated with physical pain is the same as the emotional suffering associated with psychological pain, and it's felt in the same part of the brain, 
And that's where the opiates work. So it's about the relief of pain. So the first question in dealing with addiction is always not why the addiction, but why the pain? But why the pain? I don't have a single female patient in the downtown east side who was not sexually abused as a child. Not one, not even by accident. I've talked to hundreds. Many of the men were abused, many sexually. If not sexually, then physically in other ways. Or emotionally abandoned and neglected and hurt. One guy told me that, a uh, native guy as well actually, or Métis, he's a Métis man. His mother had a unique way of babysitting him. She was a single mom and had her own addiction and drinking problems, so she went out to the bars to meet guys. She was in her early 20s. And the babysitter was the dryer. When this kid was three years old, the mom would stick him in the dryer, put a heavy object on the top so he couldn't climb out. And that was her way of keeping him safe while she was out. And that's not untypical. So this is what people grow up with. So that's why the, so why the pain then? The, the reason drugs work in the human brain is because we have receptors for them. And I'll tell you what receptors are. Here's a cell. Here's a brain cell, okay? This is my primitive drawing of a brain cell with the nucleus here. Now, here's the drug, okay? It looks like this. The, the, the molecule of the drug coming into the cell. It works only if the cell has a receptor that can receive it. But now the question is, why do we have receptors for molecules or drugs that come from puppies? We're not puppies after all. Well, mummies and puppies, I guess. <laughs> well, we don't have receptors for them. What we have receptors for are our own substances that look just like it. Okay? You know, there's, in our brains, we have opiates. We have our own natural opiates. And those are called endorphins. Endorphin. Endorphins are our body's endogenous or inner or in, naturally occurring morphine-like substances. So the reason the opiates work is because we have endorphins which look just like the opiates, and so that's why we have these receptors. But why do we have opiates in our bodies? Well, yes, pain relief. We have to have something, otherwise they would hurt too much. I mean, if I went like this, if I had no endorphins, I'd have way too much pain every time I touched anything. So there has to be something to kill the pain to some degree. So op opiates are painkillers. They're also necessary for feelings of joy and, and, and elation and, and reward. So when you do something thrilling and you're, all, and, and, and you're just overjoyed, what's happening is you're having a lot of endorphins flooding your brain. So people have, when they go bungee jumping and you measure their endorphin levels, the higher the endorphin level, the more elated they are after they go bungee jumping. Which, by the way, should tell you something about the nature of addiction, because addiction is not just about drugs, is it? You can get addicted to all kinds of things. A lot of people get addicted to dangerous activities. Why? That's how they get their endorphins. So, we have endorphins as painkillers, we have endorphins as to give us joy and elation. They also work on our immune system, they do a lot of things, but the most important thing they do, and here's the key to all addiction, and this is the least known function of the endorphins, our own natural opiates, is they connect infant to parent. They're the love chemicals. When infant, when that little baby is looking into your eyes, is it a he or she? He. He's got endorphins going in his brains. So do you, which is why you enjoy it so much. If you, if, if you didn't have endorphins, you wouldn't enjoy our babies very much. Let's face it, parents have to put up with a lot of crap, don't they? You know, <laughs> literally. And, and one of the things that makes it enjoyable is that is, is we have these endorphins floating in our brains. And so endorphins are necessary for that loving connection. They've been called love chemicals. They've been called love, molecules of love is what they've been called. You can have mice in a laboratory, infant mice, and you, you can knock out their endorphin receptors. You can actually 
um, breed them genetically so that they don't have these things. So now the, now the, endo the opiates have nowhere to act. When these animals in the laboratory are born with the endorphins receptors knocked out, they will not be upset when they're separated from their mother. Now, what would that mean for them in the wild? Their death. Their death. Because the, the mother's loving, nurturing presence is required to protect the child, to, to feed the child, and also to bring up the child. Without that, if the child does not look into the mom, because of the known difference, there's no love for the, from the child to the mother, therefore no connection, therefore no life. So what I'm saying is that the opiates and the opiate addiction arises in the most essential brain circuit that we human beings have, which is pain relief, reward, and love and connection, which is the essential dynamic in human life. Now, when you ask, why is it so powerful? Well, because that's where it arises in that most essential brain circuit. And I'll talk in a little while about why it arises there. But the point is, that's why it's so powerful. Now, another chemical that's involved in addiction is called dopamine. And I'll just give you enough science here to understand the basics. Dopamine is another brain chemical. It's necessary for human life also. Why is it necessary? To make us feel curious about something. To give us a sense of vitality and excitement. To make us explore something. When you're exploring a novel environment, like when you're checking something out for the first time and you're curious. When you're checking out the source of food. When you're seeking a sexual partner. You've got dopamine flowing in your brain. Without dopamine, we're like zombies. We're not interested in anything. We're not curious about anything. We won't explore anything. In other words, we're not human beings. I'm mentioning dopamine because all the drugs of abuse, including the opiates, release dopamine in the brain as well. But the, the, the stimulants, particularly cocaine and nicotine and caffeine and crystal meth, release dopamine in a major way. Now, if you're seeking food or the expectation of being rewarded by food, that'll get your dopamine circuits, it'll give you a 50% increase in your dopamine levels. So that's pretty good. That's why we look for food, you know. We're hungry, but also we're excited, right? When you're seeking a sexual partner or about to receive a sexual reward, your dopamine level goes up 100%. So it doubles. Now, a shot of cocaine will increase your dopamine levels by 300%. A shot of crystal meth will increase your dopamine level by 1,200%. So you see how powerful a drug crystal meth is. By the way, I will tell you that the crystal, even though crystal meth is a very powerful drug, these are all powerful drugs, they don't cause the addiction. The drugs are not addictive in themselves. I mean, just like a pack of cards. You can look at a pack of cards and not become a gambler, right? You can eat food and not become a food addict. You can, uh, somebody could open up a store, but you don't necessarily have to become a shopping addict. You can try crystal meth, and most people who try it don't become addicted to it. I'm not saying it's a good thing to try. <laughs> what I am saying is that the drug itself doesn't cause the addiction. Something else has to be there as well, and that something else is, is, is what I'll be telling you. Now, in response to your question, so he, when, when you're getting shots of dopamine from the outside, from the cocaine, then your brain says there's too much here, and it reduces the number of dopamine receptors. So these dopamine receptors on which the uh, cocaine acts, the dopamine acts, if you have too much dopamine here, the brain says, oh, whoa, 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 this is too much for me, and it'll kill off some of its own receptors. Now when you stop the cocaine, you're not getting it from the outside, and your body stops making it from the inside. It takes a while for the brain to regenerate itself. Sometimes it takes a long time. And while, you, while that's going on, while it's regenerating, you're irritable and you're tired and you're depressed and you're going through withdrawal and nobody likes being around you very much because you're, you're a pretty miserable person because you don't have enough dopamine and you don't have enough endorphins. So that's the second circuit involved in addiction. Now you have the love, reward, pain relief chemical. Now you have the 
incentive, motivation, curiosity, exploration chemical, vitality chemical, where addiction arises. And then very quickly, I'll tell you about two more brain circuits that don't work in addiction. And actually, how do we know these things? Because you could do, do a brain scan of people. You do a scan, uh, a special kind of imaging with x-ray technology of somebody's brain, and these parts don't work. And you, and, and you can see that they don't work. Now, two more circuits don't work in addiction. One of them, somebody mentioned, has to do with stress the adrenaline circuitry. Now, adrenaline is a stress hormone. And we need that. If I was to attack you now, you'd have to be able to fight back. And for that, your body would create a lot of adrenaline. That would help you escape or to fight back. The flight or fight hormones, adrenaline being one of them. When you talk to addicts and you ask them, why do you do drugs? What is it that it does for you? One of the things it'll say is, it helps me not be so stressed. Now, in other words, the addict doesn't know how to be not to be stressed. They get stressed very easily. The person who's addicted gets stressed very easily. Or the person who gets stressed easily is more likely to be an addict because they're more likely to use the drugs to soothe their stress. Because dr drugs are stress relievers in the short term. I mean, as you say, if you were upset right now, if I gave you a shot of morphine, you'd be pretty happy pretty quickly. They relieve the stress. They're stress relievers. But for the addict, they don't have enough capacity to regulate their stress. So they have to go to these external chemicals. So that's the third circuit that doesn't work in addiction. And the fourth one is what's called impulse control. Now, impulses are urges and motivations to behave or to do something. I might have the urge to, in a store, I might have the urge to grab an object and stick it into my pocket. That's an impulse. I might have the urge to go up to somebody attractive of the opposite sex and say something totally inappropriate. I mean, we all have these impulses. But there's something in the brain that says, uh-uh, you shouldn't do this. Not a good idea. You might have the urge to do an injection of heroin. Something up here is supposed to say, uh-uh, not a good idea. But the, part, the part of the brain that, that is supposed to control our impulses is called the gray matter or the cortex of the brain. And it's supposed to say no. It's okay for me to have all kinds of desires. It's okay for me to want to kill all of you. That's perfectly okay. I might be hungry or cheesed off about something because traffic was really bad, and I feel like killing everybody. Nothing wrong with that. As long as there's something up here that says, not a good idea. These are human beings. They don't deserve to be killed just because you're having a bad day. Maybe they have their own problems, you know. In other words, I'm exaggerating, but impulse control is what stops us from doing what we ought not to do. The addict doesn't have impulse control. When he or she sees the drug, sees the needle, when the gambling addict is in the casino or even thinks about the casino, when the shopping addict thinks about the store, there's nothing there to stop it. People are always talking about free will. Human beings don't have nearly as much free will as we think they do, because for the most part, we're controlled by mechanisms deep in our brains that we're not even conscious of. We think we have free will. The real problem in addiction is not the free will, as somebody said, it's the free won't. The addict is not able to say no. The part of the brain that is supposed to say no doesn't function in the brain of the addict. How do we know that? Again, you look at brain scans. There's no free won't up there. We should be saying no, but that part of the brain doesn't function. So, I'll just quickly summarize. Four essential brain circuits. The opiates, which is the love, connection, reward, pain relief, dopamine, which is incentive, motivation, vitality, curiosity, a sense of being alive, impulse control, and stress control. These are the circuits that don't work in the addict. And the people in whom these circuits don't work, they're the ones who become addicts. But why don't they work? Why don't they work in some people? 
when the American army was, went, went to Vietnam, 20% of them came back as heroin addicts. 20% of the GIs came back from Vietnam were heroin addicts. A few years later, only 1% was. So 95% of them got over their addiction, which is unbelievable. I mean, if, if 5% of my patients in the downtown east side overcame their addiction, everybody would think I was a genius of some kind. And here, 95% overcame their addiction. In other words, the drugs by themselves can't cause the addiction, because if they did, they all would have stayed addicts, because they were addicts. There's something else must be going on. So why are some people more prone? What's wrong with these circuits in their brains? And here's why we have to look at life experience. Now, most doctors and most experts who write about addiction, they say it's a genetic disorder. You inherit it. Well, that's a nice explanation. First of all, it's simple. Secondly, it makes sense. Because in a lot of families, if one parent is an alcoholic, chances are the kids will be too. So it runs in families. So it looks like it's genetic. It looks like we inherit it genetically. Thirdly, the biggest advantage of that explanation, though, even though it has no scientific basis, is that it explains everything without having to look at people's actual lives. See, if First Nations people were addicted to alcohol and these other drugs because of something genetic, now we don't have to look at history. Now what happened in this country and what continues to happen in this country is irrelevant. It's just all in the genes. Too bad. It's nature's fault. But we can't help it. But what if it's not like that? What if it's actually what happens in people's lives that make them addicted? Now that's a different story. Then you have to look at the whole society. How are we treating each other? What kind of system do we live in? How do we look after our children? And these are questions, of course, are much more painful than simply saying it's a matter of genetics. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's got very little genetics at all. Why? Because these all have to do with the brain. And how does the brain develop? How does the human brain actually develop? Well, it turns out, and this is not I'm telling you anything new, I mean, it's, you may have heard this, may have not have heard it, but I don't make it up. This is just brain science, the way we know it to be an absolute fact. It's not even controversial anymore. That the way that the human brain develops is an interaction with the environment. It's shaped by the environment. That baby, how old is that baby there? How many? Seven months. Seven months. See, in the first year of life, there are times in that kid's life when every second, million connections are being made. I mean, every, every second. A million connections are being made at times in, in, in that kid's life. The human brain is the only one that continues to grow in the same rate outside the uterus as it did inside the womb. And we're born, human beings are born with very premature brains. We're premature when we're born. We're all premature when we're born. It doesn't matter when we're born. At nine months, we're still premature compared to a horse. A horse can run on the first day of life, right? A human being can't manage that neurological control, the balance, the visual acuity, the muscle strength, the coordination for two years. So the horse is two years ahead of us in terms of brain development. So the horse developed in the mom, mother's womb in advance, two years in advance of the human being. And why is that? It's because as human beings evolved, we began to have larger and larger heads. And we began to have larger and larger heads so that we could use the hands, so that they could tell the hand what to do. Because the hand is a very, I mean, compare the hand to the hoof of a horse. This is far more sophisticated. This is far more complex. The brain has to have a lot of circuits and, and connections and systems to make this work. I mean, if you try to build a computer to make the, paw, the, the, the hoof work, and if you try to make a computer to make this thing work, Imagine the circuitry has to be much more complex, much larger. And that's why you have these large brains. So large brains, and at the same time, we began to walk on two legs. So we can use the hands as hands. So walk on two legs. Now the pelvis has to narrow. So now we have a narrow pelvis, large head. Narrow pelvis, large head, large head, narrow pelvis. You can't wait any longer inside, otherwise you'd never get born. If that kid waited another couple of months, he'd be inside forever. 
you know, unless there was a cesarean section or something. Because the head is already the largest part of the body. So we have to be born prematurely to allow our brains to develop outside the uterus. And that means that most of our brain development occurs following birth and not before. And most of that in the first three years of life. By the end of the first three years of life, the human brain is 80% adult size, and the human body is only 19% adult size. It's totally disproportionate. And that means most of our brain development occurs in the first three years, under the impact of the environment. And the circuits in the brain that get the appropriate input, that get the right stimulation, they develop, and the ones that don't, they even die. And they certainly won't develop very well. And that's not so difficult to understand. If you took a plant, a seed, and you stuck it in the floor here, would you expect it to grow? Well, of course you wouldn't. Why? Because the conditions aren't here. There's no irrigation, there's no sunlight, there's no nutrition here. Why would it grow? It's the same with the human brain. It needs the right conditions. Now, what are the right conditions? Well, it depends on which circuit we're talking about. Now, the visual circuits that allow us to see, there's about 30 different circuits making up the visual system. That needs light. If this child was in dark for the first year, five years of his life, he'd be blind thereafter for the rest of his life. Because there's no light. The brain says, I don't need visual circuitry. There's no light here. I might as well put that energy into hearing or something else. So for the development of seeing, you need light waves. Now, the circuits of the opiate love chemistry, the dopamine incentive motivation system, the impulse regulation and the stress control system also needs the right environment. Just like the visual circuitry needs light. And what is the right condition for these important brain circuits, and this is where we're letting our kids down. I'm talking about as a whole society. The necessary condition for the development of these circuits is the presence of a non-stressed, emotionally available, constantly available parenting caregiver. Without the presence of a non-stressed, emotionally present, constantly available parenting caregiver, these circuits don't develop. If you take a small if you take monkeys and you separate them from their mothers and you measure their dopamine levels, they're, they're down within a couple of days. The endorphin and the dopamine level in the child's brain depend on the presence of a nurturing parent, of a non-stressed nurturing parent. Why do I say non-stressed? I'll explain that in a moment. I could give you all the science behind that. There's, um, let me just give you one example. At the University of McGill in Montreal, they experiment with rats. And rats are easy to work with because they, they have a short gestation time, so they're not pregnant that long. And they grow up very quickly. So you can study them between birth and death very quickly. So rat mothers, when, when the baby is born, when the rat pup is expelled from the mother's womb, the mother immediately starts licking the, the rats. Licking them means um, on the perineum, like on the bum, just starts licking them. And that's how they groom them, that's how they connect with them. That's their version of bringing the baby to the breast. First they lick them. Now, some rats do better than other rats. Some mother rats lick their babies with more care and nurturing than other mother rats. If you look at the babies that are well nurtured by their mothers in the first few hours of life. And if you look at these babies as adults, they're less anxious, they're smarter. And if you look at their brains, they have more natural tranquilizing chemicals in their brains. There's a class of drugs called benzodiazepines. Benzos are drugs like Valium and Librium and Ativan and so on. We have our own natural benzos in our brains. These rats that are well licked by their mothers they have more of the natural stuff in their brains than the rats that were not well licked. But it's not genetic, because if you take the, the rats whose mothers don't lick them very well, and you put them, those baby rats with mothers who do, they grow up to be just fine. So the presence, the proper brain chemistry of the infant depends on the presence of the mother and the capacity of the mother to nurture the baby. Now, in a group of monkeys, they divide into three groups. 
and they made it, they created different conditions for food finding for these mothers. These mothers had small babies they had to look after, and they find food for them. The one group, they made it difficult. It was always difficult for them to find food. Predictably difficult. The mothers knew that it was always going to be hard to find food. They had to work really hard for it. Another group, they made it easy for them. The food was just right there. The middle group, they made it sometimes difficult to find the food and sometimes easy to find the food. So there was uncertainty. Now, guess which group of mothers was it that their infants, when they grew up, were more insecure, they had to do cocaine and alcohol? Uncertain. The uncertain group, yeah. The mothers who always find it difficult, they adjusted to it. The mothers who always find it easy, no problem. The ones who were stressed, because they never knew. And, and uncertainty is a big cause of stress. They're the ones whose infants grow up to be adults who did cocaine and alcohol. And there's so many experiments like that. Now, the same thing is true in human beings. Because when mother and infant, when I say mother, it could be the father, it could be the grandfather, it doesn't matter. The, the, when the nurturing parent is looking into the child's eyes and the child looking into the mother's eyes, the parent's eyes, that's when they both have endorphins happening in their brain. And that promotes the development of the child's circuitry. But what happens to people like Serena, whose story I read to you, and like all my other patients in the downtown east side who never had that? Those circuits don't develop. So when they do heroin, guess what? It's like for the first time, they feel love and connection. If it's for the first time, they feel human. Or the first time they do cocaine, they feel alive and vibrant and excited. And that's pretty powerful. And it's the only way they got it. So you try and take that away from them. It's damn difficult to give it up. Addiction is pretty simple. It's what happens to people when they don't get what they need. And they have to end up soothing themselves. Now, this is not about blaming parents, by the way. You have to understand that. When parents are stressed, they can't help passing that stress on to their children. They just can't help it. There's no way to avoid it. Now, I was born uh, to a Jewish mother in 1944 in Budapest, Hungary. And you all heard about what happened to the Jews in Eastern Europe. So I was born in January 44, And in March, the Nazis marched into Budapest, my hometown. The day after the... Uh, the Germans occupied Budapest, my mother called the pediatrician. And she said to her, would you please come and see Gabi? Because he's crying all the time. And the pediatrician said, of course I'll come. But I should tell you, all my Jewish babies are crying. Now, why were the Jewish babies crying? I didn't know anything about Nazis. I didn't know anything about concentration camps, or war, or genocide. Why was I crying? Do you think? Because my mother was stressed. Infants pick it up. Infants pick it up. And my mother was depressed because her parents, three months later, her parents were killed. And so when, that, when, when, when parents are in that state, so, and then trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. At the University of Washington in Seattle, they did EEGs, electroencephalograms. These are electrical readout of the brains of infants at six months of age whose mothers were depressed. And they compared them, you know, so you get this, you get this wave, like an electrical readout, looks like this. Now, they compared the EEGs or the electrical activity of the infant's brain whose mothers was depressed with infants whose mothers was not depressed. They could tell from the EEG of the child whose mother was depressed and whose wasn't. In other words, the mother's state of mind programs the electrical activity of the infant's brain. And this, these effects last a long time. These effects last a long time. Now, mothers obviously don't become depressed on purpose. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I think I'll become depressed. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. Oh, okay, I will. No, 
These things happen to people. Nobody gets stressed or depressed on purpose. My mother did not create the Second World War just so that I would have a difficult first year of life. The trauma is passed on multi-generationally, from one generation to the next, and that's how it's inherited. It's not inherited because of genes. It's inherited because we keep creating the same conditions. But that's why the drug addiction. It's because of the early suffering and the early deprivation, these circuits are crying out for those substances. And when they get them, they're happy. And it's very difficult to tell a person if something makes them feel good for the first time in their lives that they should stop using that substance when they have no other way of making themselves feel good, when they've never had any other way. Now, that doesn't mean it's hopeless. It just means that it's difficult and we can't do it by judging people, by telling them that they're bad, that they're stupid, and so on. Or even by telling them how bad it is for them. They already know that. They already know that. We have to try something totally different. There's many, many different ways to look at addictions. Now, well, now I looked at it from one angle. There's another angle, which is that drugs are a way of self-medicating. Some people have certain conditions medically that they self-medicate. Now, what do people self-medicate? They self-medicate depression. Because the drugs are antidepressants. They self-medicate anxiety. They self-medicate PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. They make people less stressed. They also self-medicate what you've got, which is ADHD. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, okay? The stimulant drugs, like cocaine and crystal meth, which most people, when they take them, they get more hyper, actually make you calmer. Why is that? Imagine this. I'll explain to you. Imagine, imagine that your brain was like a... Imagine a, a busy street corner with traffic going in four directions, you know? So you have a busy street corner, and here's... A, and you get three lanes of traffic going in every direction, right? Three lanes this way, you know? So, but there's no stop sign, and there's no traffic light. What there is, is a, an island here in the center, and there's a, cop, there's a cop standing on the island. And the job of the cop is to stop traffic in this direction so it can go in this direction, right? His job is to stop things, okay? Imagine that your brain is like this busy traffic corner with three lanes of traffic going in four directions. The drivers don't know how to stop. They don't know how to regulate themselves. They, they, there's no stop sign. There's no traffic light. There's a cop. Now, imagine furthermore that the cop went to a party the night before. So he's sitting there on a the traffic island, you know, going like this, and all of a sudden he goes to sleep, okay? What's going to happen on the street corner? Chaos. Total chaos, right? Honking and People getting angry and upset, but nobody getting anywhere, just like you in your room. Yeah. What would you have to do to create order on the street corner again? Get in your car. <laughs> Sorry? Get in your car. No, he can't do that. He's got, you got the one you got. What are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with him? <laughs> Give him coffee. Give, totally right. Give him a stimulant. Okay. Caffeine is a stimulant. Okay. Cocaine is a stimulant. Crystal meth is a stimulant. Nicotine is a stimulant. ADD is another condition, it's just a condition that predisposes to addiction and people self-medicate by these stimulant drugs. A lot of the people that are taking crystal meth actually have ADD. They may not know it, but that's what they have. Almost, any, almost anybody with addiction will have a dual diagnosis by definition. They're going to be anxious, they're going to be depressed, they're going to have ADD, they're going to have bipolar disorder, they're going to have post-traumatic stress disorder, they're going to have personality disorder, something's going to go on, otherwise they wouldn't be addicted. The good news is that the human brain can develop new circuits even later on in life. So even though the conditions, it's not like vision. Vision is, an over, vision is over at age five. If a kid doesn't see light for five years, he's blind forever. But these circuits, you can get new development even later on in life if the conditions are right. Even later on in life. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of support, but it can happen. So the point is, just because people were hurt early, it doesn't mean that they were... You know, is it Larry? So your name. Eddie. Oh, sorry, Eddie. Eddie was in his prayer. 
was talking about, he said something about the, the wisdom of healing that's inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, well that's it. There's, a, there's a wisdom in the body which allows healing and even new development to take place, even later on in life. The longer you've done drugs, the longer it takes, and the more support you'll need. But there's nobody beyond redemption. There's nobody beyond redemption. Now, how long will it take? You see, you're not just talking about the effects of the drugs. You're also talking about a lifelong trauma. So when you talk about healing addiction, it's not just getting somebody to stop using the drugs. It's also developing new ways of coping and new ways of thinking about themselves and new ways of seeing the world that they never had from, from the early life because the conditions weren't appropriate. So let me say something here about the past and the generations. The things I said about what's necessary for the healthy development of the person and the brain, the kind of parenting, that's exactly the way, as far as we understand it from historians and anthropologists and from stories of the elders, that's exactly the way First Nations people used to parent their kids. Kids that were not parented in isolated families. They were part of a village. In the village, it wasn't just a question of mommy and daddy. It's a question of the whole community was responsible for the child. The child had many, many adults around to protect them and to nurture them and to teach them. Kids were never separated from the adults. They, they were carried everywhere the parents went. The kids went with them. Just the kind of things that we're, science is now discovering we need to do to, to nurture kids. People were doing it automatically, without science, without brain scans, without all this stuff. They were just doing it. And that's why Aboriginal people, by the way, parent everywhere in the world under natural conditions. And then you look at what happens. And, and there was actually substances in North America that could have been addictive. There was tobacco here. There was alcohol in southern United States. There was peyote. But there was no addiction. There was no problem with drug use, even though some drugs were here. And it's the same with coca in Latin America. There was no severe addiction problem. So the addiction problem comes along when you destroy people's ways of life. That's when it comes along. It's that simple. You can, you can predict it. In the Western world, there was alcohol for thousands of years. There was drunkenness. People get drunk on holidays and festivities. And, but there was no alcoholism until the Industrial Revolution when people were chased away from their villages and their communities and they had to go in the cities and now they're isolated away from their families and controlled and beaten and so on. So no longer living under the natural conditions. That's when the addiction comes along. I, I don't want to say that you can't do anything about it because you can't. You did individually. And people do on a community level. But it's very difficult because there's a whole history that, that weighs down on you. And it's not just the history, it's still going on. I mean, if you actually look at what's going on, it's not like all the land claims have been settled. It's, like, like there's, it's not like there's no more discrimination. It's not like uh, governments are now being fair about it. No, a lot of this exploitation and so on is still going on. And there's a lot of in, infighting, and I don't, I don't have much to say about that because I'm not a part of it, but corruption and so on that happens in some of the First Nations organizations and so on. It's a very, very difficult situation. I have no idea how to resolve the problem. All I can say is, on a social level, Canadian society needs to do a lot more. It needs to do a lot more. Apologies are just not, not enough. We need to do a lot more. But just me saying it is going to make it happen. And, and, and Stephen Harper has never phoned me to ask me what he should do. I don't get it, personally, but he hasn't. But communities are, are going to have to find some creative response that, that this trauma has been going on. You know, and maybe, the, maybe my words can help is only with this. Maybe it can help with the shame part. Because there's tremendous shame associated with abuse. Maybe if people get it, 
that it's not their fault, that it just happened. They didn't create it. They didn't call for it. They didn't ask for it. It might be their responsibility now. I mean, whatever addiction issues exist in this community here, you can wait for Stephen Harper to come and do something about it, but I wouldn't hold your breath too much. So it's your responsibility. I mean, you have to respond. But maybe you forget that it's not your fault. Maybe you forget that the shame that's associated with addiction. Maybe you can drop the shame. Maybe if you drop the shame, that'll help lift the weight off your shoulders a bit so you can get on with it. Maybe it's the shame that keeps people stuck. The attunement piece is a big one. Attunement means when two people, when one person gets the emotional space of another person and is able to communicate that I get it. Now with babies, we do this all the time. When a baby starts crying, we attune right away. What do we do? What do you do when you see a baby crying? What happens to your face? You're aww. You know? So you're, 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 communic you're communicating that, okay, baby, I get it. You're feeling sad. I get that you're feeling sad. I feel sad too when you feel sad. That's attunement. Now we all need that. The children need it for their development. When a parent is not attuned to the child, then the kid doesn't get the feeling of being received and understood. So they get the sense that there's something wrong with them. Even if the parents never beat them or hurt them, just because if they were stressed and they were, and when parents are stressed, they can't be attuned because they're too stressed. And that's why that, that EEG or the depressed mother or the infants where the mothers are depressed, you could tell from the child's brain whose mother was depressed and who wasn't because the mothers weren't attuned to the child. Now, in terms of dealing with addiction, then, g given that the, the first condition that was lacking was this attuned presence of caregivers, what do you think the first condition is if we're going to heal people? The same thing. It's not enough to tell people that you've got to stop doing this, it's bad for you. People need, first of all, some loving acceptance in their lives. They need to be given the message that their addiction may not be okay, but they're okay. That it's not their fault. That they're not stupid, that they're not deficient. That there's nothing to be ashamed of. Nobody woke up at three years of age and said, I'm going to become a drug addict. Nobody woke up at 15 years of age and said, I'm going to become a drug addict. People drifted into it. They drifted into it because of all the stuff that I talked about. So the, we, we have to lift the shame. And the only way we lift the shame, see, drug addicts are very ashamed of themselves. Anybody here who's ever had an addiction problem, you know how ashamed you were and how poisonous that shame is and how healing it is if somebody can talk to you who's not judging you, who's not rejecting you, who's not punishing you. Who just says, hey, you got a problem. So that's the actual first step. Then in that context, we need to help people understand themselves and understand their behaviors. Let me tell you a story about myself, too. Uh, I've been married to uh, my, my wife, Ray, now for 39 years, next month. So let's say one night, 10 years ago, I say to Ray, uh, you know, I, I indicate that I like to have intimate physical contact. Sex. And she says no. And I know that's hard to believe that she would say that to me, but <laughs> it's happened. How do I react? Well, so I'm, I'm say 10 years ago, I'm 54 years old, 10 years ago, and I'm a, national medical writer for the Global Mail, and I'm a busy family doctor, and I'm a speaker and all this kind of stuff, and director of palliative care at Vancouver. I've got all these titles and achievements. So how does this guy respond when his wife says no? Well, in my case, I either go into a rage or I curl into a fetal ball like this, and I wish that I was dead, and next morning I can't even look her in the eye. No. What sense does that make? What sense does it make when there's nothing to worry about and that's when you worry? Well, I'll tell you what sense it makes. It has to do with memory. 
It has to do with a kind of memory called implicit memory. Implicit memory, okay? Um, I'll tell you what that is. There's two kinds of memories in the brain and the body. One kind of memory is what we call recall. When you can call back, recall what you had for breakfast yesterday, what you did two weeks ago, what a teacher said to you when you're in grade five, that's recall. That's called explicit memory, explicit memory or recall. But the part of the brain that remembers that way, that encodes or photographs explicit memory isn't even developed till the second or third year of life. So nobody recalls anything. If I asked you, what did the nurse wear when your mother delivered you, you wouldn't be able to tell me. There's no recall for that. Your brain wasn't even ready to recall that. To, 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 you know. But there's another kind of memory called implicit memory that's there right from birth. And that's the emotional memory of what happened without the recall. So the emotional experiences are imprinted in your brain, but you don't recall what caused the emotion. Okay? Now, you told us that you were abused, traumatized when you were two years old or one year old, right? You have no recall for that, but you have memory. The emotional memory, the implicit memory is here in your brain. Now, what do you think emotionally you were experiencing when nothing was going on, when you were one and a half years old, but you've already been traumatized? Anxiety. Anxiety that something could happen at any time. And you have to pay attention. And if you're not seeing something, maybe that's the most dangerous time at all, of all. There's a kind of um, thing that happens when mothers, are, uh, when children are separated from the mothers. Uh, the children, for the first few days, are anxious. They look everywhere for the mom. Then they give up. They get depressed. They won't look anymore. They won't eat. They won't play. They won't do anything. And then after a few days of that, they come out of it. You can feed them again. They'll play again. They'll interact with caregivers. But what happens when the mother comes back? When the mother comes back, they get stressed physically. Their heart rate goes up. They get very tense. And they won't even look at the mother. They won't look at the mother. And what do you think that's about? They don't want to attach in case she leaves again. It's called defensive detachment. The, 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 brain, the kid is not doing it deliberately. The kid's brain is doing it. The kid's brain is saying, when you abandoned me, I felt so hurt that I'll never want to be that hurt again. So I'm never going to connect with you again. Now, when I was 11 months old, my mother gave me to a total stranger in the street and said to her, take this baby away. That's what she did. And she did that to save my life because she could barely stay alive herself. And I, might have, I was very sick and I might have died. So she smuggled me out from the ghetto and... I lived with some relatives for a few weeks until the Germans were defeated and they left Budapest by the Russian army. And then I, I was reunited. When I read that story about what happens to kids, I asked my mother, how did I respond to you when our, we were reunited? She said, like an utter stranger, you wouldn't even look at me for several days. Now, my wife says no to me, okay? If I was purely an adult, I would say, okay, that's disappointing, but I can handle it. Because life is disappointment, right? I mean, life is joy, and life is pain, and life is beauty, and life is ugliness, and life is everything, including disappointment. So what? That's just life. But when she says no to me, that memory of being abandoned by my mother gets triggered. Because here's this woman on whom I'm relying in my life, and whom I, whom I depend, and I need her to love me, and to hold me, and she's saying no to me. That implicit memory gets triggered, and now I'm responding like I'm a one-year-old child. And by the way, most of the time there's a problem in your relationship with your spouse or with your friends, and you get all upset. It's got nothing to do with the present. You know that, because you go back afterwards and you say, what the heck was that about? And what it was about was implicit memory. That tells you about your childhood. You're back in a state of implicit memory. 
Now the addicts are always full of implicit memory. So what was the addict's memory? The addict's memory was that he or she was abused by authority figures. So you're an authority figure. And you speak to them in a harsh way. Guess who that makes you? They respond to you like you were the guy abusing them in the first place. And now you can't get to first base. And that means that people working with addicts have to really take care of themselves. They have to be very aware of what's happening internally. Because I tell you what happens to me, when I'm not taking care of myself, let's face it, in a relationship between myself and my clients, who's got the power? I do. I mean, I got the status. If they complain, if they complain about me, they don't get anywhere. I mean, let a druggie from the downtown east side go to the College of Physicians and make a complaint about a doctor. How far will they get? I'm just saying how, I'm not saying how it should be, I'm saying how it is. And all their lives, they have never experienced any power at all. So they won't even, you know, they've threatened and all that. I won't give them a prescription. Okay, I'm going to the college. Okay, go ahead. So I have to be very careful. Now, when I'm not looking after myself, when I'm very stressed, then I, that means I go to work and I'm irritable. And so I'm irritable. What do I trigger? I trigger the implicit memory of another authority figure who just doesn't give a damn about them. And when do I do that most especially? Especially when I myself am not living with integrity. So let me read you a paragraph here. Um, so I told you I had, I had this propensity to binge on shopping and, and obsess about it and spend a lot of money. And so when I'm like that, of course, I'm very judgmental of my patients. I'm looking at them saying, how can you be so weak-willed and why can't you just give it up? You know, exactly what I'm doing myself, right? We always judge other people for exactly what we don't deal with in ourselves. In January 2006, when I'm in the midst of an extended CD obsession, and of course, when I'm buying compact discs, of course, I become a complete addict. I lie. I bring them home, and my wife says, have you been shopping again? How can you even think such a thing? And I stash it on the porch, and when she goes to sleep, I smuggle it into the house. In January 2006, when I'm in the midst of an extended CD obsession, Sean comes moaning into my office. I'm messing up, he says. I'm puking and shitting. I've been doing heroin. Oh, man. Sean has been in the recovery home for months. I haven't seen him for a long time, but he did call regularly, proudly reporting on his progress and his determination to stay clean. Once he left a voicemail, I'm calling to say that I appreciate all your help. I just want to say thanks, man. Now he's back in the downtown east side, pale, bedraggled, emaciated, unwashed. He's been living in the streets for weeks, but plans to admit himself to a Christian rehabilitation camp. Don't you think he should be back on the methadone, I suggest? Sean eagerly downs his first dose before recounting the details of his most recent relapse. I don't know why, Doc. I thought I'd just use one time, just the one time, and that was it. So are you going through with that Christian rehab thing? My family is pushing me, but I'm not up to it. Have you told them that? No. What stops you from being straight with them, hurting them? They helped me so much, and I turned around and failed so miserably. I'm instantly filled with judgment, annoyed by his neediness and weakness of will. That is, by my own, I want to teach him a lesson. I don't believe you, I counter. Not that you don't mean it, but you're not being honest with yourself. You're not worried about hurting them. You already are hurting them. Yes, I am, but I want to go to that Christian place. I know what it's all about. It's really tough there, a complete schedule. It's harsh and rigid. That's not the point. I'm talking about telling your family the truth about how you feel and what you're up to. You just don't want to, be feel the ha you just don't want to face the hassle of being clear with them. You're afraid of their judgment or of your own. You're too chicken, to be honest. Sean throws me a direct glance and a bad smile on his face. That's how it is, Doc. Well, then get off it. Be open about what you want and what you don't want. 
that much you do owe your family. And Doc, having pushed his addicted patient to tell the truth, will now go home and lie to his wife, his briefcase stuffed with the latest haul of classical music. And that's how it is for all of us. When we're not in integrity, that's when we're most judgmental of other people. Because we can't stand seeing in others what we don't like about ourselves. Which is, I think, why people have such a hard time with drug addicts. Because who in this society is not addicted? And this is, whole society is all about getting soothing from the outside. You have to look that way. You have to be that way. You have to buy that, get that, do that. It's all getting something from the outside to make yourself feel okay. Which is what addiction is all about. Getting something from the outside to make yourself feel okay, temporarily. That's what addiction is. This whole society is addicted. The whole economy. And look at the consequence. The consequence is that we're destroying the earth. We're actually destroying the earth. And then we say to the drug addict, how can you shoot yourself full of cocaine when it's so damaging to you? Well, how can we do what we're doing to the earth when it's so damaging to all of us? But we can't stand seeing that part of ourselves. So we push it all to the addict and say, what's wrong with you? So the biggest thing that stands in the way of society helping the addict and of people individually helping the addict is their judgments. Is the judgments. So I'm going to ask a question now. I'm going to ask you to look at... Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with having judgments. It's very human. You can't help it. In fact, you're not even doing it. When you have a judgment, you're not doing it. It's not that you deliberately say to yourself, hmm, what judgment can I come up with? <laughs> nah, your brain does it, right? You're not even there. Your brain is doing it without you. You didn't deliberately make... So, when I say there's nothing wrong with it, it's perfectly human. There's nothing wrong with the judgment being there. The problem is when you believe the judgment. So the thing is to notice it. Because if you don't notice it, it's going to get in the way. So I'm going to ask you a question now. So I'm just going to ask you to look at yourself now. And tell me, if you're willing to, I'm going to invite you to tell me, to share with me, some judgment that you've had about an addict in your life. It could be somebody else. It could be yourself. So what I'm trying to say is that the most important thing we can look at people when we're working with addicts is ourselves. Is ourselves and how we respond and because how we respond has to do with us. And if we're going to work with people or with ourselves, we have to be really compassionate with ourselves and with the other person too. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? There's nothing you can do about that. <clears throat> Except that <clears throat> if you're going to be with an alcoholic, be with him. And if you can't stand being with him, then don't be with him. But don't be with him and wanting him to be any different than the way he is. Like to be with him and resent him at the same time. What's the point? You don't have to be with him. It's a total pain in the ass to be with an alcoholic. I mean, who, who, you know, nobody's expected to put up with that. But if you choose to be with him, choose to be with him exactly the way he is, without any move to try and make it any different. Because there's a spiritual teacher that I, I, I read a lot, and she said that only in the presence of compassion will people allow themselves to see the truth. 